The Nightingale by Hans Christian Andersen In China, as you probably know, the emperor is Chinese, and everyone around him is Chinese too. This story happened many years ago, but that's precisely why it's worth hearing before it's forgotten. The emperor's palace was the most magnificent in the world, made entirely of fine porcelain, so costly but so fragile, so delicate to the touch, that you had to be extremely careful. In the garden you could see the most wondrous flowers. Tied to the most splendid of them were silver bells that jingled, and you couldn't walk past without noticing the flowers. Yes, everything was quite artful in the emperor's garden, which stretched so far that even the gardener didn't know where it ended. If you kept on walking, you would come to the loveliest forest, with tall trees and deep lakes. The forest went right down to the sea, which was deep and blue. Great ships could sail right under the branches. And among the branches lived a nightingale, who sang so blissfully that even the poor fishermen, who had many other things to tend to, would lie still and listen whenever he heard the nightingale as he pulled in his fishing nets at night. Dear Lord, how beautiful she sounds, he said. But then he had to go back to his work and forget about the bird. Yet the next night, when she sang again and the fisherman appeared, he would say the same thing. Dear Lord, how beautiful she sounds. Travelers came from countries all over the world to admire the Empress City and the palace and the garden, but if they happened to hear the nightingale, they all said, that's the best thing of all. The travelers would talk about everything when they went back home, and the learned men wrote many books about the city, the gardens, the palace, but they didn't forget the nightingale. She was esteemed above all else. Those who could write poetry wrote the loveliest poems, every single one about the nightingale in the forest by the deep sea. These books circulated around the world, and one day some of them even reached the emperor. He sat on his golden chair, reading and reading, and he kept nodding his head, because it pleased him to hear the magnificent descriptions of the city, the palace, and the garden. Yet the nightingale is best of all, he read in the book. What is this? said the emperor. The nightingale? I know nothing about it. Is there such a bird in my empire, let alone in my own garden? I have never heard of her. To think I had to learn about her from a book. And then he called for his lord Chamberlain, who was so refined that if anyone lower in rank dared to speak to him or ask him about something, his only reply was, Phew! And that means nothing at all. Supposedly there is truly extraordinary bird here, called the nightingale, said emperor. They say that she's the best thing of all in my vast domain. Why hasn't anybody told me about her? I have never heard her mentioned before, said the Lord Chamberlain. She has never been presented to court. I want her to come here tonight and sing for me, said the emperor. The whole world knows what I have, but I do not. I have never heard her mentioned before, said the Lord Chamberlain. I will search for her, I will find her. But where was she to be found? The Lord Chamberlain ran up and down all the stairs through the halls and corridors. Not a single person he met had ever heard mention of the nightingale. So the Lord Chamberlain ran back to the emperor and said that she must be a fable concocted by those who write books. Your imperial majesty should not believe what people write. It's all fabrication and was called black magic. But the book I was reading was sent to me by the mighty emperor of Japan, said the emperor, so it must be true. 
I want to hear the nightingale. She must be here tonight. I bestow on her my highest favor, and if she doesn't come, then all the members of the court will be punched in the stomach after they've eaten their supper. Sing pay, said the Lord Chamberlain, and once again he ran up and down all the stairs, through the halls and corridors, and half the court ran along with him, because they didn't want to be punched in the stomach. Everyone was asking about the remarkable nightingale that was known to the whole world, but not to the one at court. Finally, they came upon a lit poor little girl in the kitchen, and she said, Oh, Lord, the nightingale, I know her well. Yes, how she can sing. Every evening I'm allowed to take home a few scraps from the table for my poor sick mother. She lives down near the shore, and when I walk back, feeling tired, I take rest in the forest, and then I hear the nightingale singing. It makes my eyes fill with tears. It is as if my mother were kissing me. Little kitchen maid, said the Lord Chamberlain, I shall arrange a permanent post for you in the kitchen, and permission to watch the emperor eat, if you can lead us to the nightingale. She has been summoned here tonight. And so they all set off for the forest, to the place where the nightingale usually sang. Half the court went along, and they were walking, and the cow began to moo. Oh, said the royal squires, now we found her. What a remarkable power for such a small creature. We're quite certain we've heard her before. No, those are the cows mooing, said the little kitchen maid. We're still quite far from the place. Now the frogs began croaking in the bog. Lovely, said the Chinese court chaplain. Now I can hear her. It sounds just like little church bells. No, those are the frogs, said the little kitchen maid. But I think we'll hear her soon. Then the nightingale began to sing. There she is, said the little girl. Listen, listen. And there she sits. And then she pointed at the little grey bird up in the branches. Is it possible, said the Lord Chamberlain. That's not at all how I imagined her. How plain she looks! She must have lost her colour from seeing so many refined people all around. Little Nightingale, cried the little kitchen maid in a loud voice, our most gracious emperor would like to hear you sing for him. With great pleasure, said the Nightingale, and sang so it was sheer delight. It sounds just like glass bells, said the Lord Chamberlain. And look at her little throat. She's singing with all her might. It's strange that we've never heard this bird before. She will be a huge success at the court. Shall I sing some more for the emperor? said the nightingale, who thought the emperor was among them. My splendid little nightingale, said the Lord Chamberlain, I have the great pleasure of summoning you to a royal celebration this evening, where you will enchant his exalted imperial grace with your charming song. My song sounds best out in the nature, said the nightingale, but she willingly went along with them when she heard that this was the emperor's wish. At the palace everything had been properly cleaned and polished, the walls and floors, which were made of porcelain, gleamed with thousands of golden lamps. The loveliest flowers, the ones with the bells attached, had been placed in the corridors. There was a draught and a great commotion, making all the bells ring. You couldn't hear yourself think. In the middle of the great hall, where the emperor was seated, a golden perch had been placed, and that was where the nightingale was to sit. The entire court was present, and the little kitchen maid had been given permission to stand behind the door, since she now held the title of real kitchen maid. 
Everyone was dressed in his very finest, and everyone was looking at the little grey bird to whom the emperor nodded. And the nightingale sang so wondrously that tears filled the emperor's eyes. Tears rolled down his cheeks, and then the nightingale sang even more beautifully. The song went straight to the heart. The emperor was so happy that he said the nightingale must wear his golden slipper around her neck. But the nightingale thanked him and said that she had already received reward enough. I have seen the tears in Emperor's eyes, for me that is the richest treasure. An Emperor's tears have a wondrous power, God knows that is reward enough. And then she sang again in her sweet blessed voice. This is the most lovable coquetry we've ever known, said the women all around, and then they put water in their mouths in order to cluck whenever anyone spoke to them. They thought they too could be nightingales. Even the Lucklays and chambermaids announced that they were satisfied, and that is saying a great deal, because they are the most difficult of all to please. Yes, the nightingale certainly was a success. Now she would stay at court and have her own cage, as well as the freedom to promenade twice a day and once at night. Twelve servants were sent along, each of them holding tight to a ribbon attached to her leg. There wasn't the least bit of pleasure in those excursions. The whole city was talking about the extraordinary bird. If two people met, one of them would say to the other, Night, and the other would answer, Gale. And then they would sing, fully understanding each other. Why, eleven grosses children were named after her but not one of them could even carry a tune. One day, a big package arrived for the emperor. On the outside it said, Nightingale. Here we have another book about our famous bird, said the emperor. But it wasn't a book. A little work of art lay inside the box, a mechanical nightingale that was supposed to look like the live one, although it was completely encrusted with diamonds and rubies and sapphires. As soon as they wound up the mechanical bird, it sang one of the tunes that the real bird sang, and its tail moved up and down, glittering with silver and gold. Around its neck hung a little ribbon, and on it were the words, The emperor of Japan's nightingale is paltry compared to the emperor of China's. It is lovely, they all said, and the person who had brought the mechanical bird was at once given the title of Supreme Imperial Nightingale Bringer. Let's have them sing together. What a duet that will be. And then they had to sing together. But it was not a success, because the real nightingale sang in her own way, while the mechanical bird ran on cylinders. There is nothing wrong with that, said the music master. It keeps perfect time and is obviously a follower of my own method. Then the mechanical bird had to sing alone. It brought just as much joy as the real bird, and on top of that it was much more charming in appearance. It glittered like bracelets and brooches. Thirty-three times it sang to the very same tune, and yet it never grew tired. Everyone could have listened to it all over again. But the emperor thought that the live nightingale should also sing a little. But where was she? No one had noticed that she had flown out of the open window, off to her green forests. Well, what sort of behavior is that? said the emperor and all the members of court began scolding, saying that the nightingale was a most ungrateful creature. Yet, we have the best bird of all, they said, and then the mechanical bird had to sing some more, and that was the thirty-fourth time they heard the same tune. But they didn't yet know it by heart, because it was so complicated, and the music master lavished a great praise on the bird. 
Yes, he assured them that it was better than the real nightingale, not only in terms of its attire and the scores of lovely diamonds, but also internally. For you see, ladies and gentlemen, and above all, your imperial highness, you can never count on what will come out of the real nightingale. But with the mechanical bird, everything is certain. This is how it will sound, and no other way. You can explain it, you can open it up and demonstrate the human reasoning. How the cylinders are arranged, how they operate, and how one turns the other. Those are my thoughts exactly, they all said, and the music master was granted permission on the following Sunday to display the bird to the people. They too should hear it sing, said the emperor. And they heard it and were as pleased as if they had drunk themselves giddy on tea. That was so typically Chinese. And everyone said, oh, and held up in the air the finger that we call the pot liquor. And then they nodded. But the poor fisherman who had heard the real nightingale said, it sounds nice enough. And it does look quite like it, but something is missing, we don't know what. The real nightingale was banished from the realm. The mechanical bird had its place on a silk pillow close to the emperor's bed. All the gifts it had been given, gold and precious stones, were spread around it, and in title it had risen to the supreme imperial nightstand singer. In rank, it was number one on the left, because the emperor considered the side of the heart to be the most noble, and even in emperor, the heart is on the left. The music master wrote 25 volumes about the mechanical bird, books that were so learned and so lengthy, and written in the most difficult of Chinese words, that everyone said they had read and understood them because otherwise they would have seemed stupid, and then they would have been punched in the stomach. A whole year passed in this fashion. The emperor, the court, and all the other Chinese people knew by heart every little cluck of the mechanical bird's songs, but that was precisely why they liked it above all else. They could sing it themselves, and they did. The street urchins sang, Xik, xik, xik cluck 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 and the emperor sang it too oh yes it was certainly lovely but one evening when the mechanical bird was singing its best and the emperor was laying in bed and listening it went clunk inside something burst buzz the gear spun around and the music stopped the emperor sprang out of bed at once and called for his royal physician. But what good could he do? Then they summoned the watchmaker. After much discussion and great deal of study, he managed to get the bird working fairly well. But he said that it would have to be played sparingly because the cylinder pegs were worn out. It would be impossible to replace them with new ones so that the music would play properly. That was a terrible shame. Only once a year did they dare let the mechanical bird sing, and even then it was almost too often. But then the music master gave a little speech using big words and said that it was just as good as new, and so it was just as good as new. Five years passed, and the whole land suffered a great sadness, because everyone was truly very fond of their emperor. Now, they said he was ill and about to die. A new emperor had already been chosen, and the people stood outside on the street and asked the Lord Chamberlain how things were going with their emperor. Puh, he said and shook his head. Cold and pale, the emperor lay in his big, magnificent bed. The entire court thought he was dead, and all of them had run off to the street to greet the new emperor. The valets had run outside to talk about it, and the palace maids were holding a big coffee party. All around, in the halls and the corridors, 
cloth has been laid down so that no one's footsteps could be heard. That's why it was so quiet, so quiet. But the emperor was not yet dead. Rigid and pale he lay in the magnificent bed with the long velvet curtains and heavy gold tassels. High above a window stood open and the moon was shining on the emperor and the mechanical bird. The poor emperor could hardly breathe. It felt as if something were sitting on his chest. He opened his eyes and saw that it was death sitting on his chest. He had put on the gold crown and was holding in one hand the emperor's gold sword and in the other his magnificent banner. All around in the folds of a great velvet bed curtains peculiar heads were sticking out, some of them quite horrid, others so blessedly gentle. They were all of the emperor's good and bad deeds looking at him, now that death was sitting on his heart. Do you remember this? One after the other whispered. Do you remember this? And then they told him so many things that the sweat poured from his brow. I never knew that, said the emperor. Music, music, the great Chinese drum, he shouted so I won't have to listen to everything they're saying. But they kept on, and death nodded, as the Chinese do, at everything that was said. Music, music, screamed the emperor. You blessed little golden bird, sing now, sing. I've given you gold and precious things. I myself have hung my golden slipper around your neck. So sing now, sing. But the bird stood silent. There was no one to wind it up, and otherwise it couldn't sing. But the deaf kept on looking at the emperor with his big empty eye sockets, and it was so quiet, so horribly quiet. At that moment, close to the window, the loveliest song was heard. It was the live little nightingale who was sitting on a branch outside. She had heard about the Emperor's distress, and that's why she had come, to offer solace and hope. And she sang, and the figures grew more and more pale. The blood began to flow faster and faster through Emperor's weak limbs, and Death himself listened and said, Keep singing, little nightingale, keep singing. Yes, if you give me the magnificent gold sword. Yes. If you give me the opulent banner, if you give me the emperor's crown. And Death returned each treasure for a song, and the nightingale still kept singing. She sang of the silent churchyard where the white roses grow, where the fragrant elder tree stands, and where the fresh grass is watered by the tears of the bereaved. Then Death had such longing for his own garden that he floated out like a cold white fog, out of the window. Thank you, thank you, said the emperor, you heavenly little bird. Of course I recognize you. You're the one I chased from my realm. And yet you have sung the evil vision away from my bed and driven death from my heart. How shall I reward you? You have already rewarded me, said the nightingale. I want tears from your eyes the first time I sang. I will never forget that about you. They are the jewels that make the singer's heart glad. But sleep now and grow strong and healthy. I will sing for you. And she sang. The emperor fell into a sweet slumber, so gentle and refreshing was his sleep. The sun was shining through the window when he awoke, strong and healthy. None of the servants had yet returned, because they all thought he was dead. But the nightingale was still sitting there, singing. You must stay with me forever, said the emperor. You shall only sing when you want to, and I will smash the mechanical bird into thousand pieces. Don't do that, said the nightingale. It has done the best it could. Keep it as you always have. I can't live in the palace but let me come whenever I wish. Then, 
In the evening I will sit on the branch by our window and sing for you, to make you both joyous and pensive. I will sing about those who are happy and those who suffer. I will sing about the evil and the good that is kept hidden from you. The little songbird flies far and wide to the poor fishermen, to the farmer's rooftops, to everyone who is far from you and your court. I love your heart more than your crown. And yet the crown has a scent of something sacred about it. I will come and I will sing for you. But one thing you must promise me. Anything, said the emperor, standing there in his imperial robes, which he had donned himself, and holding the sword that was heavy with gold pressed to his heart. One thing I ask of you. Tell no one that you have a little bird who tells you everything, and things will go even better. Then the nightingale flew off. The servants came in to tend to their dead emperor. Oh yes, there they stood. And the emperor said, Good morning.